Welcome back, everyone, to Crime and Entertainment. Today, we have a very special guest. And when I say special, it hits home for me because I was a huge horror movie fan, still am. And back in my younger days, this young lady was one of the ones that beat down Freddy Krueger. And not many can say that. Here today, we have Lisa Wilcox. How you doing? Hey, hey everybody. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to have you here. Now, listen, I got to tell you right off top, part four was my favorite as a kid growing up. Cool. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Now, and the reason being is Freddie just got a little bit cooler in that particular movie. And we're going to get into that a little bit later. But first, let's start with you. Like, where, where did you grow up? I grew up in Missouri actually. Uh, I was born in Columbia and then we lived in Columbia, St. Louis, and then we briefly were in a little town called Washington, Missouri. And then my dad was offered a great job in Southern California. So we all moved to Orange County. All right. Now, how did you like that? Did you like Orange County? Was that a big change there? I bet so. It was a, yes, it was a very big change. <laughs> we were, because that we were at that point, living on this beautiful lake in Washington, Missouri. But my sister and I were so excited about California, you know, California boys and, you know, yes. the whole groove. So it, we were, we were, we were really stoked. All right. So now when you were coming up there, did you always have aspirations to be an actor? Or did you find that out <laughs> a little bit later or how did, how did that come about? No, that's a great question. Um, I actually in Missouri in my freshman year of high school, I did my first play, um, you know, the TV show MASH? Yes, yes. Okay, so actually it was a Broadway play at one time. Okay. So anyway, so I had a little role, two scenes. I played Ms. Randazzle. So just by the sound of that name, um, I was the secretary in the, in the uh, high heels and the tight little pencil skirt and the whole thing. And our scene, um, so it's, I'm the secretary, there's the boss, I go sit on his desk. We have this little banter. Um, it was comedic relief and um, we did the scene in front of the curtain because behind the curtain they were changing the sets for the next act. Um, so I go out and I'm doing my little saunter with my steno pad and my pencil and everything and um, one of the footlights, um, you know the footlights they could be locked or unlocked right, right up or down so they were supposed to be down and locked. Well one of them was not locked and this is where I have to walk it opens, my foot goes down into the, <laughs> the cave Boy. of the footlight, literally center stage. And I can't, my, my shoe is like dangling because the strappy sandal shoe, uh, strappy pumps. And I'm stuck, I'm totally stuck. So the guy's playing my boss, we start improv he's like, well, you had a little too much drink there, Ms. Randazzle. <laughs> anyway, so behind the scenes, behind the curtain, they finally realize something's gone amiss, gone awry. And so uh, one of the actors sticks his head out of the curtain and he helps free me from the footlight, put my shoe back on, pick up my pencil and steno pad and proceed to do the scene. Now there's, mind you, like 400 people in the audience, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and, and they're laughing. They thought it was part of the, part of the, the scene. Yeah, so they were none the anyway, wiser. Yeah, so I was like, anyway, it was actually exhilarating. It was exhilarating. And um, the next uh, Monday at school, everyone was like, oh my God, that was amazing. <laughs> so I went from like nobody to somebody. It was very exciting. So, and then we moved to California and I had no intention of being an actress. No, 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 no. Um, I, I wanted to go into the medical field, actually. I had my aspirations to be a doctor. Okay. So, um, so I make friends in Irvine, California at high school. And a friend of mine said, oh, I'm going for this audition at Buddy Epson's Theater in Newport Beach. You want to come with me? I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? So I go and the producer <laughs> kept tapping me on the shoulder going, you're auditioning, right? I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm just here with my friend, just here with my friend. Anyway, she was very persistent. So I auditioned and I got the lead in Lanford Wilson's The Hot L Baltimore. And from then on, so what was I, 15 years old? From then on, I did play after play after play, equity waiver. I did a couple high school productions, but most of, them, most of the ones I did were out in the community and then went to UCLA, theater arts degree, and there you go. <laughs> wow. 
So, I mean, after that little, I guess you can call it debacle on the, the stage, <laughs> probably because you had to play it off and, you know, the, the adrenaline that was probably pumping, that probably put it into you that, hey, this is something I can do. Yeah, I think it it did. It definitely did. And then getting that the lead role, that lead role too was was really amazing. Um, do you know the actress Kelly McGillis? Yes, from um, Top Gun. Top Gun. She was yes. in Top Gun. And anyway, her mom directed me in the play. Actually, oh, that play okay. in the port is pretty cool. Yeah. So where were you at in your career when the Nightmare on M Street came calling. Where and I guess before that, were you a horror movie fan in general? I like to ask that. Yes, I have always loved horror since I was little. Um, the first novel I ever read was Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, when I was like fourth grade. That was not on the reading list, by the way. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> and I always loved ghost stories and paranormal and all of that. My mom would take um, my sister and I during the summer to the library check out books and, and whatnot. And that's what I was always checking out. So yeah, I was already a huge fan of the Nightmare on Elm Street series um, when I got the role. <laughs> okay. Now, at what point in your career did you get that? Pretty early on, I would say 1988. Let's see, 82, 83, 84, 85. Let's see, when did I graduate? I graduated from college in 1986. So it was two years. So I had done some, some guest stars and commercials, print work, you know, that kind of thing. Um, what did I have done? I had done a Hardcastle McCormick. I'd done a divorce court. Um, I, I was doing enough to live on, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street was a big break for me, definitely. Absolutely. So now did you, did you, you have an agent or something at the time that gave you the script for that? That's kind of how that worked there? Yeah, um, through UCLA, I did a lot of plays. And I got a manager and an agent um, uh, due to my work that I had done. And so, yep. So they submit you. They submit. This is old school. Hard copy. <laughs> hard copy 8 by 10 Hard copy resume. Um, and um, But interesting enough, um, my manager had told me he submitted me, but he said they wouldn't read me. Um, they have to understand back then, I, have, I was a virgin, platinum blonde, um, all the makeup. Think of the 80s, okay? Yeah, yeah. I look like a cheerleader, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I look like a cheerleader. I look nothing like what they had in mind for Alice, right? Right. So Annette, Annette Benson, who's the casting director of, I think she casted all of the Nightmare on Elm Street. She tell, told me the story that they actually auditioned hundreds, hundreds of actresses for Alice and they couldn't find their Alice. So they went to their reject pile, which I was in, and they gave me a chance and I went in with, you know, I read the script. I, I totally related to Alice in so many ways. And I went in with like dirty hair, no makeup. Uh, I wore my worst color, which is pale yellow. And um, I had one, a callback on a Friday. Um, and I actually read with Tuesday night and Tuesday who reprised the role of Kristen. Right. She says she cast me. She was the first one cast from Nightmare 4. Okay. Um, because she was replacing Patricia Arquette. Right. And um, anyway, it got down to me and another gal. And Tuesday was like, nope, Lisa Wilcox, Lisa Wilcox. So um, it was a Friday call back. And I was getting married that Sunday, <laughs> 150 people wedding. <laughs> and I learned on my honeymoon that I had booked the role of Alice. Well, that's good. So you only read for Alice. You didn't read for nobody else. I read for nobody else. Wow. Okay. Now, Rini Harlan did this film. Um, now at the time he had done what, uh, was it prison? That was like the only thing. Prison. Mm -hmm. prison. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and I mean, as people would know later on after this, this kind of launched his career. Cause he would go on to do die hard Two, uh, cliffhanger, long kiss, good night, deep blue sea, all great, great action film. Mm -hmm. And this is what kind of catapulted him. How did you enjoy working for Rennie here on this film? Oh, it, he was great. He was great. Um, he really was, I call an actor's director. Um, right. He loved our input, you know? Um, and I think that created a fantastic chemistry on the set. Mm -hmm. And and honestly, I, Annette Benson, I want to say she cast friends for life, honestly, because we all just got along so amazing. So that chemistry you see on the screen, that, that was totally real. And I think that's why people really bond with Nightmare 4 too. It, nothing seems forced about our friendships, you know? They feel real and genuine. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, um, but yeah, Rennie was, he was great. There's a scene um, in uh, the Crave Inn and I, um, and there's a shot where, um, let's see, I, okay, so I'm in my waitress outfit and I'm figuring out what busy work I want to be doing, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to polish silverware, right? So I'm, so I picked up some forks and I'm doing that. And there, then there was this amazing shadow on the wall. Okay. Right there. And I'm like, Renny, Renny, look, look, look how cool this is. He's like, oh, in his Finnish accent. <laughs> uh, and he says, he picks up the knives, gives me the knives. So you'll see that shot real quick, oh. but that shadow of knives on the, on the wall. <laughs> so that's the kind of experiences that we had. We discovered things along the way that kept adding just, you know, little something more, you know? So yeah, he, I adore him. Um, I hadn't seen him in years. And then there was a screening of Nightmare 4, 30 year uh, reunion kind of thing at the Chinese theater. And uh, Renny actually flew in from China yeah. for this. And Bob Shea was there too. And a lot of us cast members. And anyway, when Ryan, Renny and I saw each other, we like started crying, you know? <laughs> So anyway, and also his mom's name is Lisa. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. And what you mentioned there, the Crave In. Now that's an homage to the original Nightmare Director, if people don't know, which if you're watching or listening to this episode, I'm sure you do, but we'll go over it anyway. Wes Craven, who done the first one. I think he he did didn't he do three as well. Uh yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He um he was the you know creator of the nightmare series, so his last name Craven, and then the Craven. That's kind of a little homage to him there. But I w- I remember watching the uh, what was the Elm Street Legacy, uh, the big documentary they did on all the films, and Rennie said that he was trying to get that job, and and Bob Shea wasn't too keen on giving it to him, and he basically was just like in the office every day, just waiting for him <laughs> to walk by to kind of say, look, yeah. I, you, you need to give me this job. And he did. And he said every time he was on set, he just seemed like he was really displeased and he thought it was going to be a disaster. But obviously, as we know, it turned out to be a great success. <laughs> I think until what uh, Freddy vs. Jason, it was like the highest grossing film of the whole series, I believe. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah it was a huge box office smash hit um, that summer. Um, it was released in August. And uh, yeah, I mean, it top, it was top of the charts for weeks. Yeah, we right. were thrilled <laughs> i bet so and like we had talked about earlier for a minute nightmare four that kind of became what was known as the mtv freddy you know with his kills and his one-liners and and putting on the sunglasses did you guys know that was kind of the direction that this film was going as you were doing it or was that all kind of a surprise to you i think if, for me and, and i think for us it was it was a surprise because we're filming our scenes but then when we watch the movie, it has all that great music, right? right? Which right. we didn't, that's not written in the script, what music you're gonna choose, you yeah, know? Yeah, you don't get that feeling when you're doing it. Yeah, right? so so we didn't know, but when we saw it, it was like, oh my gosh, this is, and, and just the humor in it and the, the pacing, the music, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely the, the MTV version. <laughs> Yeah, because I think Robert even said in an interview, he said he was just, he was kind of burnt out. It was like it was another one. And then when he seen the direction it was going, it kind of revitalized him. And he was like, all right, I'm ready to go. You know, this is <laughs> we're do another one. Yeah. So we'll get into the movie itself here. The first one to go is King Cade. And I'm using movie names here. Um, he was a carryover from Nightmare 3, The Dream Warriors. He, had, like I said, was the first one to go. I love that opening sequence with his dog in the uh, <laughs> uh, junkyard there. I love that opening sequence. And it's still, even as I'm older, I thought maybe I was just, you know, a kid like, and I loved it even now that I'm older, you know, him coming out. <laughs> and the way they filmed that when they backed out, it was actually, all those cars were like microscopic. It was really cool the way they did that when they panned out. Mm, yes, I agree. Yeah. Now, did, uh, did you have a relationship with those guys there? Because they don't. He didn't last very long, and Joey also a carryover from three. They were they were the first two to go. Yes, they were, and um, I think we we had. I'm sure I'm in a scene or two with them. I think at the Craven. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Um. But um. 
yeah, I didn't get to work with them very much. I know them much better now, years, right. years later from the conventions. In fact, I went to Joey Rodney Eastman, yeah. his Rodney, wedding. Yeah. Uh, he recently got married. And, and back then, I had, I, uh, ever since Nightmare 3, I had the biggest crush on Rodney Eastman. You have no idea. <laughs> and he knows it too, because I told him. <laughs> And he didn't say much in that film. He had what, a couple of words there. I don't think he said much at right. all during that film. That was, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, and now his death is more, I guess, more iconic too with the waterbed. Now, did you see how they constructed that? Were you there? Because from what I understand, they built like a tank up under the waterbed and they would literally have to like come out, take a breath, go under the bed, shoot the scene. And it took quite a while to get that done. But yeah. the end result was priceless. I mean, it was it was really cool. It was quite uh, quite something what they built and how they made it work. Um, there's amazing an amazing book by Nick Strong, who was the production designer for Nightmare Four and plenty of other movies. But he wrote a book called Behind the Screams, and he talks about all of the production and value and how they built like how we did the theater scene and how the waterbed scene and all of that. So if you can ever get your hands on that book, I highly recommend it. Yeah. I'll definitely have to check that out. Cause I'm, that's one of my things is I love watching movies, going back, listening to maybe commentary and behind the scenes. I'm really into mm -hmm. that sort of thing. In another life, I probably would have went to film school myself and been a director <laughs> that I wound up being a welder. That's really opposite. end. <laughs> You could work on a production then as a welder. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, so the third one, as you mentioned earlier, Tuesday night, who uh, reprised the role from three there, she replaced, like you said, Patricia Arquette. Um, in her scene there, when she goes, I got to tell you, I know for the movie's sake, we have to follow the storyline, but had she died without giving you her powers, that was kind of be the end of it because Freddie wouldn't have anybody else to go, but she throws right. you her power there as she's going. <laughs> And it just puts a whole new spin on things there. How did you enjoy working with Tuesday? Because I know you guys are still friends now. I think you've done a convention not too long ago with her. Did y'all y'all bonded pretty good there? Oh yes, we just saw each other um, in uh, at Scares the Care in Williamsburg, yes. uh, Virginia, mm -hmm. and we'll be doing another show too uh, at the end of this month. Um, but oh no, uh, we 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 got along great. We we and year and years later actually we started a business called Toe Brights, which we had for almost ten years. Um, illusion band toe rings we became business partners and um, started it from home and then it grew and grew and grew to where we had this huge distribution in Japan I went to Japan and did Japan you know um, shopping channel there and we were all over the United States so yeah yeah we're, we're very close she and her mom are like family and she's actually got she's got a song on the soundtrack right isn't the was the yes. opener right yes yes they needed a song and so she uh, she wrote a song. I think she said she spent like four or five hours to put it all together, and then presented it to um, out of her car <laughs> one day at work, and said, "Renny, come on out and listen." And there you go. I, I didn't know that till much later that that was her. I remembered the song uh, because I watched the movie a dozen times on VHS as young, but yeah. I had no idea until <laughs> recently that that was her. Yeah, she's an amazing composer, amazing singer. Mm -hmm. She plays piano, guitar. She's she's multi multi talented. So after the returning guys from Nightmare Three, we start to get on to the new kills here. Now the first one to go is Sheila, played by what's that toy Newkirk? Is that her name? Yes. Okay. So she was the first one to go and it was pretty memorable scene there with the hand through the desk and Freddie with the apple. Were, were you there when that scene was shot? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yes. Yeah, what did you think definitely. of that? Because that, from what I understand, that robotic arm, it had to really kind of grab her, you know, in the face a little bit. Cause I don't know if that time they had it all down pat, but it really had to grab her to make it look real. Yep. 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 And, um, and uh, then there's the kiss, of course. And yes. uh, I hopefully maybe one you'll get to interview Toy, but um, his his teeth, you know, they're fake. Right? Yeah, dentures. the dentures. Yeah, that was that was the coming dentures. up. Yes, <laughs> fell in her mouth. <laughs> oh man, that had to be. Oh man, that's probably I, I explains know. the look of disgust on her face. <laughs> 
you imagine? Um, but what I also remember about that scene is when they did the bird's eye view, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, they, you know, when we're shaking the desk and um, the DP was like, yeah, the more you shake it, the more it looks great from up here. You know what I mean? So we were like, it was a workout. Let me just put it that way. Yeah, because it locks you in from the side and you can't get out, you know, and you're screaming there. Yeah, that that had to be a an experience for her because I've had, you know, those uh those Billy Bob teeth, you know, that was all the craze mm. a few years back. When you took them out, they're just, they're got all kind of mess in them. And I can just imagine what was probably flowing into her <laughs> I mouth. Know, right there. I know, I know. Probably no acting required for some of her facial expressions. <laughs> you know, be grossed on. out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Now, as a kid, like I said, I thought this was cool, but they actually ran out of money from what I understand when they did your brother's kill, they had a more elaborate setup and by brother, your, your own screen brother there, Rick, they had a more elaborate scene set up for his death scene, something in the elevator. But from what they said in the documentary, they ran out of money. So they kind of had to on the fly, come up with him fighting them, basically the invisible Freddy. <laughs> well. Well, I don't I don't recall um but if it's in the documentary I'm sure it's true you know um, yeah, they, and I have watched the document the documentary but I haven't watched it in quite a while right um, but uh well I guess that's pretty clever <laughs> I guess yeah. there was something when he was in the elevator and I know it was going down real fast and it kind of was sucking him back you know but they said that they had something where the bottom was going to fall out but budget restraints kind of restricted that so they just basically came up with the the fight hmm. scene there and he said he'd done like a couple of, you know, sessions of karate and they didn't really want him to do any karate. It was all like roundhouse punches and right. hard kicks and all that. So yeah. yeah, I guess a pretty, pretty clever way. You got an invisible Freddy there. You don't even really need him on the set, I guess, for that. <laughs> I guess he needed a day off. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, they were coming up on the fly with stuff left and right there. Um, but, you know, I think it worked. Uh, it was really well done. And then probably the craziest kill of them all in nightmare four is debbie and that's played by brooke uh what's how do you pronounce her last name there these Thies. Thies? okay Thies. now she's you know the tough chick you know you, she's you know somebody you don't want to mess with and man her death scene i got i gotta believe all you guys were there watching that or, or most it's, of it anyway it's pretty uh pretty crazy it's turning into a bug oh boy yeah. so <laughs> not she, any bug a cockroach <laughs> yeah i didn't see that coming so she's sitting there lifting weights and then freddie comes you know over top of her and presses the barbell down and her elbows like pop out I yes. was like, jesus christ and then she's literally turned into a roach she's got the tentacles coming out of both arms as it's really wicked looking. And then she's in that goo. And I had watched that documentary that I told you about a while back, but in preparation for this, I watched it again, specifically the nightmare four part. And it was just really nasty looking what she had to lay her face into. That was some <laughs> nasty looking stuff, man. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, um, and what's so interesting too, is like back then, you know, there was like no CGI. These are all practical effects. Yes. So, um, and honestly, when I watched for fairly recently, I was like, you know what? It really holds up, man. You know, the effects are amazing. It does because I mean, you can tell nowadays on stuff that CGI, what they did with the computer. And like you said, back then y'all were doing that. I don't know what that stuff was made of, but it, I believed it was some sort of roach glue or whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> whatever I don't, it was, I don't I know what it. they used, but I bet Mick Strong's book would tell you. Yes. <laughs> and I'm definitely going to pick that up for sure. Cause those are some things. I mean, the documentary is great. If anybody hadn't seen it, it goes over all the movies, um, you know, all the way up to the most recent one. So it's really good. I recommend any nightmare fans go out and take a look at that. Um, so after that here, all these people are kind of killed off. Um, you know, you're going to head to Freddy here in this kind of ending scene, but on the way we see your character evolve in the beginning, you're more of a plain Jane, quiet and then as each one of these people die you kind of get a little piece of something from them you mm -hmm. know you kind of gain a little bit from each person now when mm -hmm. you're going for this final scene here because your your boyfriend in there dan he doesn't die right he doesn't die in that film i think he, no. get, he gets hurt right he's hurt yes he gets hurt yeah so 
when you're going to Freddie for this final scene, did you have any sort of like training for that? Or what did, what did you do in preparation for that? Um, well, they did send me and uh, um, Andras, who played Rick, my brother, they sent us to karate school. Uh, so we did get some training on like how to use the nunchucks and some moves and, and whatnot. Um, uh, but also I had just amazing stunt doubles, of course, that were Olympiads, basically gymnastic Olympiads. So um, there would be some days where when we're doing the church sequences, um, you'd see, I'd see like four other Alice's running around in the leather jacket and the jeans and all that. Um, I had taken some gymnastics I, in high school so I was able to at least start, you know, do the start the cartwheel or whatever, but then it would cut to the body double or scent double doing, doing all the effects. So. Right. Now you guys were walking across church pews and all that. I'm assuming that was a, a double for Robert there in the makeup as well. Cause that, that took some balance there for sure. For them guys. We, I remember walking on those pews. A lot of it he did though himself. And a lot of it I did myself. Um, but there was, um, when we were up high, I don't know, probably about, I'd say five feet up off the ground um, and we're sort of circling each other and stuff, but there were, there were plenty of um, um, people that on the side in case we fell off, right, you, yeah. know. Uh, you know, like when you do a tra the trampoline, you know, you want to make sure you have, you know, people. Out. Yeah. So, um, uh, but yeah, it was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of hard work. I bet that was that probably one of the more challenging sequences to get filmed that final fight scene there between you guys, or was it something else? Um, I think actually for production, the most challenging scene was the theater scene. Um, the flying into yes. the, the, into the screen, the, the popcorn and the soda spilling mm -hmm. the way they wanted it to spill. Um, they actually built a, the theater. So it was like this straight instead up. of this yeah. straight up so they could get that the popcorn in that uh, soda happening. And um, yeah, it was like f oh, 14 different kind of setups that they had to do for wow. the theater scene. So that was definitely the most challenging. And yeah. then of course you have once I'm in the screen, through the screen, black and white in front of the Crave Inn mm -hmm. and then filming in the Crave Inn that's now you know all decrepit and, and spider webby and all that stuff. So you go a, lot of, into a lot of moving parts. Yeah, you going into that screen, that even looked like really good for the, I guess, the availability and, you know, stuff y'all had at the time to film that. I mean, that was seamless. That was probably cutting edge at the time there for, because it looked mm -hmm. seamless how you just went from mm -hmm. straight into that. I mean, it was, yeah, you know, great. Super cool. Yeah, great effects there. Yeah. So, I mean, and we touched on this earlier, the MTV Freddy, but I mean, at this point in time, Freddy Krueger is exploding. I mean, all over the world. He's got he's got a 900 number, for God's sakes. You can call 900 <laughs> Freddy and talk to him for a couple of minutes. I mean, he's got pillows, you know, posters, pajamas. And let's not forget this man, his backstory is he's a convicted child predator <laughs> freed on a technicality, and he's got pajamas that kids are wearing. I mean, it's, <laughs> these people were cashing in on the Freddy merch, and I mean, it's like nothing I'd ever seen. I mean... What did you guys think about it at the time? Was that kind of after Nightmare 4 or was it during the shoot? Because, I mean, it, Freddy Mania was just crazy. It was Freddy Mania. It really was. And with this huge success of Nightmare 3 and 4, um, it was certainly on a roll. No question about it. No question about it. Absolutely. And I yeah. got something here. This is, I got this right after the movie came out. I don't know if you can see oh, it. Oh, neat. It's one of the original posters. It was it was given to me as a gift as a kid, and for a while I didn't even want to hang it up in my room, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> I did when I got older, and I left it there for a long time. And I think a poster had gotten put in front of it, and not too long ago I found it tucked behind what poster was in front of it. And I was like, man, I gotta, you know, I gotta hold on to that one now and put it back up. Definitely. Uh, <laughs> so many things that I think I had the Freddy Krueger doll. I had a Freddy Krueger glove. I had the mask, the hat, the whole get up. I mean, they just, they really, really cashed in on the Freddy Krueger aspect of that whole thing. Because after four, you know, like we had talked about his success, it was just through the roof. How long after four were you contacted about five? Um, pretty quickly after, um, trying to remember, um, they had chosen their director, Stephen Hopkins, 
and um, they called my agent and I had lunch with Steven and we hit it off and, and um, we made the deal. So um, it was probably just a few months afterwards, I would say. Okay. Yeah. So not long. I know during that time they were spitting these out back to back. Yeah. And one more thing I wanted to touch on on four, cause I, I I'd kick myself if I went past it. Wasn't there a scene there where y'all constructed like a 20 foot version of Freddie? Was it, I think it was his chest. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. And, and my apologies for not mentioning that before we got on to, to part five, but tell us a little bit about that. Cause that was pretty interesting there. Because obviously watching it as a viewer, you've got no idea that you're looking at a 20 foot scale of his yeah. chest. But yeah. that was that was pretty interesting there. Yeah. In fact, I just posted a picture recently of that um, when my mom was visiting on set. And there's a picture of us by the ginormous I Freddy seen chest. That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, well, because it had to hold people in it. So uh, it was massive. Um, it did uh, during filming. I wasn't there, but I heard it fell over. Yes, that's what I was going to get to. If you but were no there, one I was, heard just... I don't think anyone was hurt. Yeah. Um, but, 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 yeah, <laughs> it was dangerous. I can imagine you got a call home and tell them you had a 20 foot Freddy chest fall on top of it. <laughs> but it's, it was pretty that. phenomenal. And think of that sweater it had to be made, you know? Yeah. And, <laughs> and one of the, um, the people that was coming through there was actually Leanna Quigley. Uh, yep. you know, I've been in a lot of horror movies, uh, Night of the Demons, uh, Return of the Living Dead Part Two. Do you know, uh, you know, Miss Quigley? Yes, I have definitely met her. I've met her yeah. at conventions. Yeah, definitely. And, She's cool. And now seeing that after the fact, I can tell it's her. But before I really had no idea. But now that I'm knowing what I'm looking at, I know I, I can say, yep, that's her. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> and, and like I said earlier, as a viewer, you got no idea. You're looking at a 20 foot constructed chest of, of Freddy Krueger. Yeah, it's it was massive. That's what you guys can do with the, with the <laughs> Right? <laughs> so you got the script for five pretty quick. I want to say these, these were probably coming out about every year. At that mm -hmm. point. So the only ones that come back from part four over to five is you and Dan. Right. Okay. So, and was, he was pretty keen on coming back and reprising his role also. Uh, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Now he, um, obviously doesn't make it very far in this particular <laughs> film, kind of like an homage to the first one. He goes off pretty quick. Yeah. And that was a really cool death scene that he had there with the bike and uh, everything that was going on with that. I really enjoyed that. What did you think about that? Did you see any of that? Because from what also I understand, they cut a lot of that from the movie, a, a lot of the full shot of it. Yeah, it was really awesome. Him like basically becoming part of the motorcycle. And yeah. they had to cut a lot because of the rating, the way the ratings work, it was, it was yeah. too violent. So they had to cut out a whole bunch of stuff to make it an R rating instead of an X rating. So because of the violence and the gore, yeah. yeah it, it was a shame because I seen some of the effects of how the bike was coming alive and it basically turned him into something off the Iron Man looked like, but the, it right. was so much cut out of what they had done. It's crazy. And I mean, that's gotta, that's gotta tick some directors off putting all that work and effort into it. And then the, who do y'all submit that to the MPAA? Is that who that goes to? Yeah, the producers do it that way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah they weren't happy either because they have put time and money, time exactly. means money into these effects and then have it all end up on the floor. Total bummer. Yeah, that's that's gotta that's gotta suck there. Now uh, open it up with this Freddy, unlike the Friday the thirteenth sequences, it's not known too much for nudity scenes. It's more like your horror and stuff like that. Now you kind of had a somewhat of that in the opening of five but then it quickly got away from it were you comfortable with that or that wasn't you how was that went there yeah that wasn't me it was a body double because <laughs> that was I, I it was like seeing that tub it made me i never wanted to take a shower in a shower <laughs> like that because i always thought that that might happen i was if anybody had a shower that looked like that with those doors that shut i never would take a shower in there. i just i'd go somewhere well, else it was wait till i got home <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was me part of the time. Obviously, you see my face, but I had right. a bathing suit that was yeah. like cropped here. Right. And in fact, they kept saying, can you move the bathing suit down a little more? And I'm like, it's not going any further down. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you got to tighten the shot. Um, and um, the body double. And then when I 
thrown into the insane asylum thing, you know, walking down the hallway. That was the body double. She made me right. look fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was, it was, uh, but I was in the water. I mean, you know, I mean, and what was scary for me is right above, of course, the scene is lit, right? So there's these right. can lighting right over me. And I'm just like, oh, I hope that safety chain is on <laughs> because if it falls, I'm going to be electrocuted. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so that was only the part that made me nervous. Not, not that they were ever unsafe or anything. I'm just saying psychologically, it's like, oh, there's lights right over my head. I'm in water. You a know, bit of built in fear there for you there. Yes. Something happens, yeah. like you it's said. It's like throwing a blow dryer into a bathtub, you know? <laughs> exactly. And like I said, I, I still to this day, I'm weary if I go to, you know, a lot of times my grandparents, you know, or, or older people have those style showers and I'm just, that's the first <laughs> scene that pops in my head. And I'm just like, man, I, I ain't, I ain't. I'll yeah. get it tomorrow. Or I'll go to a hotel and take a shower. I'm not getting in there. <laughs> now, this movie, it only, am I right that it only had three kills? Um, I don't know. I never counted, per se. Dan, it was the girl that they, that he basically fed to herself, and then the one he killed in the comic book. It was only three. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. That's pretty low for, uh, well, it seems low. <laughs> I haven't went back and actually counted, but I guess that the way he was mowing through people in three and four, it seems low, I guess, for the role or the the, the role Freddie was on. How mm. did you enjoy this film as opposed to four? Was it better experience, worse experience, kind of the same? What was your experience there? Um, I had actually like more dialogue and, and whatnot in Nightmare Five. And right. Nightmare Five, you know, is such such is such a different film from four. Very, I mean, we go very, from Freddy on the Beach to Five, which is actually uh, the film with the least amount of Freddy time on right. the screen. And um, but I still, I think, it, I call it the brave, a brave little film because it dealt with so many taboo um, subject matters mm -hmm. like teen pregnancy, abortion, yep. alcoholism, anorexia, bulimia. Okay, yes. <laughs> it deals with a lot of heavy subject matters and i don't think the response in 1989 it was just too taboo you know yeah. but now you know over 30 years later i find um just meeting um you know supporters from you know, the conventions um five for them is their favorite one so um it's very interesting to see that that transition i just think it's better understood now than it was in 1989. Right, That's and I, I agree 100% because as a kid, I mean, I watched all these movies, like we said earlier, I was a huge horror fan, so I watched them all as soon as they come out, either in theaters or on VHS. And as a kid, Five wasn't my favorite, but as I got older, as an adult, and I would have these horror movie marathons and just run through all of them back to back, watching it later on, I had a little bit more appreciation for what the characters were dealing with that I really didn't understand, you know, as a, as a youngster watching that, uh, I got a little bit more appreciation, like you said, for all the stuff that was, that was going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now the death with the anorexic scene, what was the actress that played her name? It escapes me at the moment. What was e Erica the Anderson. Erica Anderson. Now that was a pretty interesting death. basically feeding, feeding herself to it until she just exploded. Were you there for that scene there for the, her death scene? Uh, no, I wasn't there for her death scene, but we did have a scene where she's like in the refrigerator. Yes, yes, you have the refrigerator. So, there. so, but so, believe me, I saw her prosthetics and how she. I mean, oh my gosh, poor thing, this beautiful woman, um, and with that thing, oh my gosh. Yeah, and I think she said whatever that she had to wear, like her mouth. It was she was beginning to like drool and stuff. She had to wear it for a real long time. Yes, yes, it yeah. Crazy. It Greta was, Gibson, it was, I think. It was tough. <laughs> yeah, that was her was. name on the show, Greta Gibson, I think it was. Now, yeah. after that, it was Mark Gray. Now, he's kind of the, I guess you would say, maybe the Rick character from Nightmare 4, you know, opposite your boyfriend. But he's got a very interesting kill, too. Uh, it goes into kind of a black and white and then a comic mm -hmm. book style thing. What did you think of that final product? And were you there for that filming of that at all? Or um, no, I wasn't there for for that. But when I had read the script, I thought it was incredibly clever. You yes, know, it was the way it was, it was put just together. super clever. You know, and 
going into the comic book and all that. So I, I was very intrigued when I read the script for sure. Now, obviously, you know, you kind of have your final bout again with Freddie and I know obviously he goes on to make a few more movies, but what did you think of the ending, how they wrapped that up? Because from what I seen also in there, they didn't really have an ending planned up until pretty close to wrapping that. It was kind of a, I don't want to say on a whim, but it was kind of, we still don't know exactly how we're going to wrap this up. What did you think of the ending? I think it works. I think it was, it totally works. And that fact that Amanda takes him back, you know, and it, it's, it's sort of sorrowful actually, you know? Um, um, so anyway, yeah, I thought, I thought it worked. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you had such a climactic ending there in four, um, you know, really memorable. And then five, obviously, like you said, you're dealing with some more tougher situations involving the kid and all that. And I didn't realize until you said it, that was his least screen time. It was five. That was the least time Freddie was on screen. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so how was Robert to work with through both of these films? How did you and him get along? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, we had... Um he was wonderful. He already had achieved some fame, of course, you know, right. and he was just completely down to earth. And <clears throat> we were all definitely had the same intention, which was to make this film as, as good as we possibly can and work together creatively. And um, so, yeah, he was lovely. <clears throat> he had, um, I had a rinse put on my hair. Remember I had virgin platinum blonde hair and they asked me to dye my hair. And I didn't want to permanently dye it, although I may as well have, because it's kind of like throwing red dye on white. It stained yeah. my hair. <laughs> so, so, but anyway, <clears throat> a rinse was put on my hair every day in the makeup trailer, which took time, believe me, because it's very wet and they had two blow dryers on my head to get it dry. And um, so, and Robert, of course, had hours, you know, getting the makeup put on. So, yeah. so we spent a fair amount of time together in the makeup trailer, <laughs> talking and chatting and stuff. Yeah, they said he's a uh, he's got a lot of stories there in, in the documentary. They were the one of the makeup guys, I forget which one, but he said he was he was trying to wait for him to finish his stories before he continued to make up. Yeah. They had to tell him, look, you can't stop. You just got to keep working. He's not going to stop yeah, talking. No. If you wait, yeah. you're never going to get the makeup on. We'll be here all night. <laughs> yeah, and Robert has a very uh, very high energy, you know. So um, anyway. God bless him sitting in that chair for four hours. <laughs> I, that's gotta be brutal. I imagine that's uh, I, probably one of the reasons why he, you know, hung the glove up, I guess, so to speak, was that was probably had to be pretty, you know, brutal for him to sit there through all those makeup sessions. Yes, um, indeed. <laughs> now you're, you're obviously you're out of six. Did they contact you for six at all? Or was it mm -hmm. kind of just moving on from the character, a whole new set of people? Things yeah, like no, they never contacted me. Okay. Now, did you watch Six? Were you still a fan of the franchise? Did you watch it? I think at that time, I saw it later, but because um, I was married and I was having babies. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that'll put a hold on. So yeah. I didn't leave the house much for a few <laughs> years there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but no, I've never stopped being a fan. Yeah. Yeah, I remember going to C6 when I was little. My mom took me to the theaters and it was 3D. It was mm -hmm. it was one of the first, it might have been the first 3D movie that I personally ever seen. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about that, how to kind of put that in there because it hadn't really been done very much in a horror film. I think the only one before that that I can remember, at least right off the top of my head, was Friday the 13th. Three, I think it was, was 3D, but that was long before my time. Um mm -hmm. But they actually wrote it in. She told you at the end when to put on the glasses uh, and then you, for you to see the effects there. And that was pretty neat. W when you watch Seven, Seven is just totally different from all the rest. It's real life. I think it's new nightmares. It's all the real characters. Wes Craven is in it as himself. Robert Englund is in it as himself, as well as Heather Langenkamp. What did you think of that when you seen that? Did you think that oh, was Oh, I liked story? it. I thought I it was really it. interesting. Yeah, I, I, I totally dug it. Yeah, I love that. And obviously, you know, we spoke as a coming up watching these films, kind of like your Kobe and your Michael Jordan. You've got your Jason fans and your Freddie. <laughs> you always wanted to see them go after one another. Were you on board for the, the Freddie versus Jason? Did you like that? 
yeah, I think it's, hey, why not, right? Exactly. <laughs> monster fights monster. And it, it took so long to get that film made. And I was happy with the final product. There's still a big debate of who won because he's walking out of the water with his head. But then Freddie gives you that little wink there because you know mm -hmm. he's not he's not done. Who who do you who does who do you say wins that? Oh, Jason. <laughs> I guess when he's coming out holding your head, if you're winking or not, he's he's probably got a leg <laughs> up there. I guess you can say. <laughs> now we'll we'll touch on the remake here a little bit. The story wasn't bad, but it's just hard to envision that role played by anyone but Robert England. He embodied it so much, and that's not a knock to Jackie Earl Haley, who put on the glove for that film. But it's just you can't you can't duplicate Robert England's Freddy. It's just it's one of those things that just probably shouldn't be touched, in my opinion. I I like the idea of it coming out, and I like it continuing, but it's just it's one of those things that you just it's almost nobody should try it, in my opinion. What did you think? Um, yeah, I mean, Jackie Earl Haley is an awesome, amazing actor. I'm a huge, amazing. huge fan of his work and and whatnot. So it's through no fault of his own, absolutely not. Yeah, it's just like you said. It's just that Robert England has embodied Freddie. He has the height. He has the moves. He has the seduction. I've always looked at Freddie as seductive. He the way he is, you know. Um, he doesn't play monster, you know what I mean? Right. Um, and he's, he just, he's, he's ready. Yeah. yeah. And unlike, you know, a lot of the other big monster guys at the time or horror movie villains, you know, Leatherface, who's obviously under a mask, Michael Myers, who's under a mask, Jason, who's under a mask, they could change out guys and the, you know, the audience would really be none the wiser. Um, Kane Hodder kind of gave Jason some life by his breathing and he was kind of known for that, but you couldn't change out Freddie. And I think that was obvious there with six. If you take Robert away, it takes something from it's still a good film. You know, I, I watch it and I enjoyed it, but it's just when you take Robert away, it's just kind of like that that loved one, that relative that you know, you know if it's not him. And it's just it, yeah, like uh, like you said, unto no fault of his own, fantastic actor. But that's probably one they probably should have just left where it was uh, looking back. Um, yeah. So you're doing the conventions now, uh, where you've been doing them. Uh, how do you enjoy that meeting the fans from, you know, all these years later that still, you know, love the film, love, you know, all the aspects of it, you know, come to see you probably autographs, pictures. How do you enjoy that type of thing now, all these years later? Um, I absolutely love it. I love hearing, uh, fan stories. I love hearing how nightmare four got them through some hard times. I love hearing um, so many women that have said, you know, Alice was such a powerhouse and she fought and her, 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 her change, her, her ability to find herself and her strength and how it inspired a lot of people. Um, so, I mean, it gives me goosebumps. I mean, I'm just really honored, you know, yeah. um, to hear um, their revelations, you know, so it's great. I love it. And like you said, it's a testament to you and, and everybody on the film and Robert and all your, your co-stars for it to be something that still draws in crowds, you know, all these years later. Um, all you guys were fantastic in that. Uh, what do you, do you have anything coming down the pipe? Are you still dabbling in acting here and there? What, what have you been up to here recently? And have you got anything on the horizon? Um, yeah, I left, I did leave acting for quite a while. Um, raising my children and, and whatnot. Um, but I've started back and actually I have a movie I did called Mystery Spot and it's actually having its first premiere in London. I think it's called Fright Fest Festival, something like that. So that's the end of this month. Um, I did a Lifetime movie last year actually um, and I called Killer Escort. So it's not one of those sweet ones. It's it's Killer Escort. Right. <laughs> and I uh, I run the escort agency and one of my boys is being very bad. Uh, super fun role, uh, Michael, um, let's see. Uh, then I have, I'm actually filming um, the first week of September, um, a film called The House That Eats Flesh. And I have several other projects that's, um, that are um, happening. So, so you'll be seeing me. <laughs> there you go. That's good. So still in the horror genre here, it's definitely home to you, I guess. 
um, Mystery Spot isn't horror so much, um, and the Lifetime movie is not really horror, so that's kind of a nice change, but but the other two movies I'm doing this year are horror related, yeah. Now, you said you were, you ran the escort, now do you got guys working for you, is it girls? Or guys. Women? Guys, okay, so, and... and so they're they're being a little bit on the bad side there. One one of them's being very naughty. <laughs> okay. He's stalking one of my clients, so it's not good. Not oh, good. Bye. All anyway. right. There you go. We're gonna have to tune into that one and take a look at it. Listen, this was a fantastic interview. You're one of my favorite characters from the Elm Street series for sure. You know, it was a pleasure to have you on. Um, one of the things we like to do here is now looking back. And obviously we touched on it earlier. You said how you sent in your, you know, eight by 10 and, you know, hard copy and all that <clears throat> totally different world now, totally yeah. different. People are doing auditions through Instagram, Facebook, they're getting noticed, they're blowing up, you know, and with COVID it's changed even more. What would you give, what advice would you give any aspiring actress, you know, mm. trying to break it into any aspect of film, not even necessarily horror, but any, what would you give? What advice? Um, my advice would be to go see lots of theater, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> including things like ballet and uh, concerts and plays, um, <clears throat> travel to observe how other people live, yes. um, walk and talk. Um, it's sort of like collecting your repertoire of, for characters that you may play in the future. Um, so I think that's just very important, um, to expose yourself to all kinds of cultures and, and entertainment. So that would be my, my advice. Have a broad range there. Yeah, definitely. Cause like you say, you don't ever know what, what that role that you might be meant for. You might wind up playing, like you said, you yourself went as kind of just an onlooker and you wound up getting the lead. So you, you don't ever know. I always say you want to be ready. That way you yeah. ain't got to get ready. It that's just, right. That's right. And take classes, take scene study classes for sure. Always be working on your craft. Always be working on it. Well, that about wraps it up here. Look, we appreciate you coming on the show. We will love to have you back maybe later on down the road. I would like to see if we can line up something with you and Tuesday night together. See if we could, you know, kick back some old memories from, from four. I think that would be a blast, but we, we want to appreciate you coming on. It was a fantastic interview, and we certainly here at Crime and Entertainment wish you well on anything you got going on going forward, and we will definitely be in touch. Uh, any closing thoughts here to close it out? Um, no, just um, if you want, um, I'm fairly active on Instagram, and it's just the Lisa Wilcox, and I have uh, Facebook too, Lisa Wilcox, Lisa E. Wilcox, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I have a website, Lisa E. Wilcox where you can um, get autographs. Then I'm trying to keep it as current as possible as far as what cities I'm gonna be visiting. Uh, and um, just uh, everyone hang tight. I know we're tired of the masks and, and all of that, but hang tight, you know, eventually things will get back to normal. So just have patience. And, um, and anyway, come see me at a convention. <laughs> Absolutely. Like she said, folks, check out her Instagram. They usually advertise where they're gonna be. These conventions are, you know, all over the place. You never know where she's going to pop up. I'm going to probably roll this poster up and drop it in the mail to you and get an autograph on that, by the way. Okay. All right. Well, we enjoyed having you on. This was Lisa Wilcox. I am Wade Williamson, Hollywood Wade. And unfortunately, we are out of time here. Go ahead, follow us on Facebook or like us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram. This podcast will be available on all platforms, Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get your podcast. And this particular interview will also be uploaded to YouTube and you can see it in its entirety. Until next week, folks, have a lovely, lovely evening. And this is Crime and Entertainment. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Bye.